Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Conscious Grief Series 5. We are joined by Dr. Lynn Prashant today. Welcome, Lynn. It's so great to have you here. Honoured. Yes, honoured. And you have an amazing wealth of experience that you're going to share with us today. And one of the things, um, you are a fellow in thanatology, which is the study of death, dying and bereavement, as well as being um, a somatic thanatologist and a therapist. And you have created something called degriefing. So first of all, maybe you could explain what is degriefing. Uh, I would love to. I'd like to start off by saying that degriefing in and of itself, the name, it's an oxymoron. It's like jumbo shrimp. And it's it gives me the chance to explain because people say degriefing. At one point, people were saying debriefing. Well, it opens up a channel of communication. The intention of my work, and there's a list of premises, but the main premise is that grief is the most available yet untapped personal fuel for transformation. Because in so many cultures, we're taught if you don't have something nice to say, don't say it. And if it's going to make me sad, I don't want to hear it. And why are you still crying? Why are you not over your loss? So I'd like to say we don't get over our losses. We change relationship to them. We don't stop loving the people we've lost. We learn to love differently in absence as we once. There's a difference, of course, yet we learn to love them in absence. And I invite my loved ones into this metaphoric fifth chamber of my heart which is where my late husband lives and my beloved sister, Donna. So that when I miss them, which is regularly because I love them and cherish my time with them, I can go to my heart and talk to Donna or talk to Mark. So degriefing came out of what am I to call my work? The intention is the transformation of grief as fuel. And what I've learned is to add degriefing is integrative grief therapy because we employ the expressive arts. We use any kind of therapeutic expression that an individual can find comfort, release, perhaps reward in the application of planting a tree in honor of their loved one and watering it and feeling connected or putting gemstones around it, or making a donation such as even a scholarship in a child's honor of a free bicycle or a gift of art classes or art supplies, a way that we can keep alive within us that which we've lost and continue to learn from and appreciate. The operative word with loss is grief. The operative word with grief is loss. The operative word with trauma is terror. So in today's world, what we do is we ask, what are your dreams like? Dreams from trauma are terrorizing dreams quite often. Dreams from loss are sad and memorable. And sometimes individuals wake up and still have tears flowing. So we meet each person where they are. And we normalize for them that people grieve in their own way. And grieving people need to be heard. So sometimes a grief-stricken or a bereaved individual will need to repeat what happened. What was it like? Because then they may be listening to parts of their story that in the emotion of loss, in the shock of loss, they're missing pieces of their story. I'd also like to comment on something that's quite misunderstood. Even though we know a loved one is sick or has a diagnosis that is an insufferable diagnosis, that will lead to loss of life. Death is always a shock. 
even if we know it, we know it's coming. What sudden death offers is the surprise aspect, the unpredictability of life and loss. So to people out there who are grieving long-term illness of a beloved friend or family member, shock is part of the actual stoppage of breath, the prana, the life force. And I know when my husband was so sick with head and neck cancer, when he stopped breathing, <gasps> I went into shock and then I was confused. I knew he was dying. So we need to educate the public in the actual nature of what illness and loss offers in terms of altering our life experience. And this is for people that are surprised when they go into shock. It's part of the truth of loss, that whether it's our dog, which is a misunderstood amount of pet loss and how cherishable that is, how whether it's loss of opportunity, money, job, health. We have finite losses, which is loss of an individual to death or a beloved pet. But we have non-finite losses like multiple sclerosis or long COVID or Lyme disease. And we need to learn with those types of losses that are called non-finite, something we might learn to live with that will continue throughout our lifespan. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Lynn. So much amazing information in that one answer. And, you know, you were talking about um, the ways in which we can remember, you know, like the planting the tree or um, having crystals around something or paying for a scholarship, things like that. And I often refer to those things as modern mourning, you know, ways of outward ways of expressing our grief. And you live in Mexico. And, uh, you know, one of the celebrations of the Mexican culture, which I would love for you to share about, is Day of the Dead. Day of the Dead, this past year on November, on October 30th to November 3rd, I had eight people gather from Mexico, and in this class was U.S. I've had people come from England, come from Canada and other parts of Europe. The intention of the Day of the Dead opportunity is to steep ourselves in both our personal beliefs about loss and then reflect that in contrast to the colorful uh, decorations in the towns in Mexico. The Mexicans believe that the icon uh, drawings and T-shirts and uh, portrayal of skeletons, others might look at it as morbid. The Mexicans look at it as realism, that we are all here temporarily, that it uses the Buddhist philosophy of impermanence, that we're all here temporarily, and that we can celebrate, excuse me, we can celebrate and honor the, that which we've lost because we recognize that it's a journey that we're on. And so Day of the Dead, All Saints Day, All Souls Day, I took my group to the local cemetery and we walked around very humbly, very uh, maturely observing the rites rituals and traditions of how people eat certain foods at the gravesite. They come and paint and decorate and plant new flowers. There are fresh pictures of their loved ones. The Mexican culture uses laws, i.e. in this case, the death, All Souls Day, All Saints Day, to cherish life, to honor those that have touched our lives and have moved on. And the celebrations around town, the colorful decorations, the altars, the rituals, the acknowledgments, that this is all part of the tree of life, the circle of life. It was very moving to observe from the first day, it's a 40-hour intensive training, from the first day to the last day, the different facial expressions, the different questions that group members ask. We also use the Mexican tradition of what are called retablos, 
or nichos, which are little altars that have a door that opens. Each student had their own altar to decorate. And then we used expressive arts. We paired up the students and one would lie on brown paper. The other would trace the body in any position. And then the individual would fill in with collage, color, shells, stones, plants, that which represents what's going on in their body, which is why I call myself a somatic anatologist. Working with grief, the embodied grief that we carry because we haven't yet made peace with the fact of what we've lost. Finite losses, non-finite losses. Aging is a non-finite loss. So just embracing that is a step toward more conscious acknowledgement of who we are. Yeah, and I really love that you're mentioning these griefs that we don't necessarily think of when we say the word grief and that every stage of our life I often think gosh women have more grief than men because of our like menstrual cycles and we worry more about aging and our weight fluctuates and you know things like that that we get upset about but um yeah it's all it's all meaningful you know it all brings up a lot of emotion and and thinking of the body you, and the somatic work that you do, you know, this is an area which I really love to teach people about because a lot of people don't understand how much emotion gets stuck in the body. Um, so perhaps you could talk to people, tell people about the somatic work, what somatic means, why okay. we need to listen. My very first profession was that of a physical education teacher. Then I went on to teach aerobics. Then I went on to study yoga, then massage. It seems that me as an individual have always been drawn to the physical nature of being. Um, if somebody said you need to sit and be a computer programmer, it wouldn't fit who I am or my personality. I'm involved with the human aspect of what this life offers. So the somatic aspects, when I taught at UC Berkeley in California, Berkeley, California, I brought that piece forth. What's going on in the body? How do we address the body? Now, Western philosophy and Western medicine has consciousness living from the neck up, that it's the head, it's the circuitry of the brain, the cerebral aspect of life is where Western culture has us focus. Eastern culture informs us that we have consciousness in every cell. So if something is going on in my, let's say, around my abdomen, and I ask myself, what is this? If I use Eastern philosophy, I might realize that there are energy centers and that the energy center might even have a name and that also has emotional uh, attributes. So if in my studies with yoga, the third chakra, which means wheel, which is energetic movement, is the power center. So if somebody says to me, you know, I feel like I've been punched in the gut, I might ask them, who has interrupted your sense of feeling powerful? Or I feel stabbed in the back. Who has betrayed you? Now, how does that information translate to me as I'm listening? The information that a person that I'm working with is giving me, such as I froze, or I was white knuckled, which represents fear, or cat got my tongue, I couldn't express what was going on. It's the colloquial, colloquial use of language that gives us information where people are referencing their emotional experience through body descriptions. I started to realize as a massage therapist that people were coming to me, not just with physical pain, emotional pain. And as that became more and more noticeable in my practice when I was working in Northern California, I realized that we're not listening deeply. We're not hearing the communications. So saying something like, please tell me more about that, or describe your pain for me, please, or what time of day, Grieving people need to be heard. 
So using active listening, referring to their words and what they've told me. I hear you say you feel punched in the gut. When did that happen? What happened? Oh, then they begin to perhaps put pieces of their puzzle in place. We're not looking for a cure because there's no cure to loss. It's part of the human condition. We're lurking to learn to live with loss, to recognize that the vulnerability of the body and the truthfulness, the body is the barometer of our truth. It doesn't know how to lie. If my body says I have a headache, I can't say, oh, no, 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 you don't. I can ask, what do you need? You need water? Do you need to rest? What do you need? So I use the body when I work with people. And since COVID, more of my work is on Zoom internationally to absolutely apply what I know in user-friendly language gives people tools to take away from the sessions. And I know that you know that. And so I might actually say, are you noticing, are we connecting the mind-body syndrome? Are we, are you noticing in your work, people are more aware of that connection as well? Yeah, I am noticing that. And I was just, I was thinking how it's interesting in the Western culture, how, like you say, we're from the neck up and we think consciousness is in our brain, but then we have all this language to describe a pain in the neck, you know, I, I it was a gut punch, um, right. you know, Shoulder language blood. of yeah. describing how we feel in our body and yet... Most of us are very disconnected from our body and we think I have um, a pain in the upper right shoulder and you don't think, okay, well, what's that, the emotional, you know, part of that? We just think, oh, I'll take a painkiller or go to a physio or have a massage. Yeah. We're living in a culture now, a global culture of quick fixes. Mm -hmm. And so pain in the shoulder, you're right. What pill could work for that? rather than what does my shoulder have to tell me? I encourage people to dialogue with their bodies. Okay, shoulder, what are you carrying? Is it actual physical pain or is this emotional? So for empaths in today's world, there's a lot of introspective work that's needed so that we normalize, is this my pain? Am I sensing another's pain? So you mentioned when we ask people, if I say, what are you feeling? And I get the response, well, I think. I say, no, no, no. Tell me what you're feeling. Yeah, I think. Oh, what am I feeling? They may not know. Yet the first step is recognizing, I can't even tell you what I'm feeling. Aha. So we normalize that we can't change something we're not aware of. And so the work is about conscious grief conscious bereavement, conscious participating, whether we're a caregiver, we're a therapist, we're a family caregiver. What is it that we're learning as part of our soul's journey or our life path or what we're here to experience as humans? And so I want to connect Tara at this moment, global grief and its impact on personal loss. Thank you. We're living in a time that's tumultuous. We have two active wars going on. We're speaking right now, January 2024. We're presenting your beautiful conference in twenty in February 2024. In fantasy thinking, maybe the wars will have stopped by then. In realistic thinking, there are people suffering terribly from these wars, that even when the stoppage of the gun firing, there's people that need help and food and medicine. There's a name for that. It's a name made up of two other words. It's made up of solitude and nostalgia, and it's called solastalgia. And it's the grief over the loss of the world as we once knew it. Now, you and I have a number of years that we can reflect back. When I think of babies being born now, or two-year-olds, or three-year-olds, or five-year-olds that have worn masks for a couple of years, 
the world's very different. And many of us grieve the simplicity, perhaps the assumptive simplicity, the assumptive world of simplicity. Yet world today, world as lover, world as self, as Joanna Macy writes books on deep ecology, we're needing to realign our purpose, our sense of well-being on the planet with the losses that we've experienced globally and recognize that some sensitive people are tuning into loss that's not even necessarily theirs and to help them identify what is yours that we can work with? What is others that we can let go through us as the spiritual teachers call this hollow bamboo that we register these the pain of loss yet we let it go through us if it's not ours to work with. And that in and of itself really is so, so important because we're barraged by, excuse me, social networking. Mm -hmm. And the social networking often barrages us with lots of information that our minds don't know what to do with. So that's another piece, this loss of privacy, yeah. this barrage of, when I was a kid, we didn't watch wars on TV or on social media. Now we see it as it's happening. I know. My brother, we dealt it's, with the Vietnam War. Yeah, and it's a very tricky thing, isn't it? Because it's like we want to be informed, but we need to be conscious of how much we can absorb, you know, through watching atrocities in the other country, in these war zones. Yes. Um, and... I wonder if you have any um, advice for people, the empaths who are watching what's happening and feeling the grief so deeply and how they can let go of that in a daily practice. Self-care at this time of life on the planet is really not optional for us to hope that we can function optimally. Taking time to discharge. I have a list of what I call the somatic quick tips. Nostril breathing, running hands under cold water, shaking the hands out because the hands uh, hold so much energy. All our nerve endings are in our hands and our feet. And so just consciously taking care of my hands or giving myself a hand massage, consciously using nostril breath, Nostril breathing keeps panic and anxiety at a minimum. When I'm doing my work, I do my best to consciously nostril breathe because my role is to be present, to hear, to listen, to absorb, to ponder and reflect. So I've got to trust that I know how to take care of myself and that I'm not afraid of heavy or deep emotion because I have tools for discharging. Now, for some, that's automatic writing. For others, it might be going, getting on the treadmill. It could be taking a hot shower um, and then a cold shower. It could be a hot bath in Epsom salt, lavender, and Roman chamomile. We use aromatherapeutic oils. Um, actually, right here, I'll show you, is my Roman chamomile. It calms the central nervous system. And, and promotes awareness and gives me the opportunity when I'm listening to some very difficult stories to keep deep breathing and let it go through me. Mm -hmm. I am, when my students are looking to be certified, one of the things I ask of them is a four to six week self-care plan. Mm -hmm. How will they integrate the tools that we've offered, the integrative therapeutic tools, massage, yoga, acupuncture, aromatherapy, collage, automatic writing, poetry, um, uh, creating an altar, planting a tree, um, writing a song or an article. Because the human needs ritual in order to transform with intention. And we have modern day rituals, as you've day modern day loss, modern day grieving. And so we've got to 
meet the moment with creativity and with intention. We don't want to force anything. We want to offer and allow and invite. Pema Chodron is a wonderful teacher on the circuit these days, and she teaches about inhaling the pain and exhaling love and peace. That's a Tonglen uh, meditation, Eastern, to stimulate and cleanse every cell in the body. Again, Eastern uh, philosophy gives us a lot of permission to feel from head to toe and even the energy fields around the body. So our work as practitioners is to meet each person where they are. Listen to what they tell us. If somebody says, you know, Lynn, I'm afraid of needles, I don't tell them about the benefits of acupuncture because I'm listening and addressing them. We're all the same and we're all different. That's duality. That's what yoga functions on, hatha, sun, moon, night, day, masculine, feminine. We are globally, Tara, each of us that recognize the changes, seeking a new homeostatic balance, a level of acceptable nutritional input, emotional process work to acknowledge the complexity of today's world, to honor that which we know and be open to learning new tools, new possibilities, new ways of looking at uh, the aging process and self-care and uh, individual um, knowings, knowing ourselves, honoring who we are, and being available to others in their time of need. Being a compassionate listener is a great gift. It requires focus and intention. We can't fix, raise, we can't fix, rescue, or save another. We can serve them. That's palliation as well. When people have serious and very uh, difficult illnesses they're dealing with, if a doctor says, you know, we just need to use palliative care, we need to understand that that's comfort care. That that's serving the being instead of saving the body, promoting dignity in whatever's going on, whether it's mental illness, physical illness, emotional imbalance, is finding vehicles, tools, and offering different integrative modalities that can meet each person. Because we're we're a unique group of humans on the planet at this time. One of my students changed the spelling of human. She spells it H-U-E-M-A-N because we make up the hues in the rainbow where the humanity has all colors involved. So I love that and I share that because there's a humility in acknowledging that we're all in this together. Yeah, I love that. And I think what you're saying about, you, you know, our the, the, our the generations as we evolve, we become more complex, you know, we become more emotional. We need to, to talk about our emotions more than ever before. And I think that's why all of these practices of, of becoming, you know, the wellness world is becoming what it is because as you said when before we spoke before we started recording this anxiety has gone up exponentially since covid and yes. you know the next the younger generations are coming through with more complex emotional behaviors and and this is why all of this work is so pertinent and so important right now I agree with you. I think the timing is perfect. I think what humans like you and I recognize is that we can be part of the solution, molecule by molecule. We're not looking for, um, there's a phrase called psychic whiplash, too much too soon, and we have to kind of step back and reclaim. And in today's world, it's step by step meeting people 
engaging, opening our hearts and finding ways to be present in difficult situations at difficult moments in time. How would you define conscious grief? For me, the concept of conscious grief, conscious bereavement, means I participate. I tell myself the truth. I acknowledge what I understand and what I don't. I work toward feeling whole. When we lose something dear to us, sometimes some say, in a song that Paul Simon wrote, he said, losing love is like a window in your heart. Everyone knows you're blown apart. How do I heal the hole in my heart? How do I allow myself to go to the depth of what loss feels like, knowing that I have the tools to strengthen? Another one of my teachers, whose name is Stephen Levine, says when the heart breaks and then heals itself, scar tissue being stronger than regular tissue gives us more capacity to embrace love and loss. Stephen Levine's been one of my most profound teachers. He, he approaches the truth of grief in a very uncomplicated way that as humans we attach and as humans we lose these attachments. And we learn to live with the ever-changing landscape of what life offers and then what disappears from that life. And so conscious grief or conscious living, conscious dying, which is what Stephen and Andrea named the work that they were doing globally, means I engage in the tears and the laughter, the heartbreak and the joy, the service to another, the participation in their life, whether they have six months to live or 60 years to live, that each moment is precious and I'm aware of the unpredictability and the vulnerability of the human condition. And so I also use Don Miguel Ruiz's work, The Four Agreements, to make no assumptions. There again is the assumptive world that we create. Uh, Dr. Robert Niemeyer's work talks a lot about that. And it's how, when we finish being together today, what does my life hold for me? There's an assumption. And then reality will show me the truth of what's so. So conscious bereavement gives me a time to heal. Mind-body-spirit integration is how I define healing. It gives me the opportunity to learn about myself while I honor, living in the honor of my late husband, Mark, and my late sister, Donna. It gives me a chance to spend my days in service, humbly take care of myself, and recognize that it is a magical mystery tour. It is what the Beatles said. It's a wild ride. So I say if we buckle our psychic seatbelt and we keep on the path, to me, that's what conscious bereavement invites me to participate in. Amazing. I absolutely love that. Thank you so much, Lynn. This has been such an enriching conversation. I'm so grateful to have met you and connect with you. Um, I'll give you this opportunity if there's anything else you'd like to share with the listeners or viewers before we finish. Yes, I would love to invite people to look at my website, which is degriefing.com. I also offer anybody who is considering working with me or exploring the nature of their grief, I've been shown internally and from my heart to others, 20 minutes or a half hour as a gift. Anybody can call me and say, I want to talk about something. I'm not really sure where I'm at. And I will offer in 2024, the same dates, October 30th to November 3rd, another Day of the Dead, degriefing intensive. And I invite you, San Miguel de Allende is a lovely spot on the planet. It's yeah. a world heritage city. And uh, you don't need to be fluent in Spanish because it's an internationally touristed city. I invite you, write to me, give me a call. I would love to share what I know. I'm shown to do this work, that that's what my life's work is about. 
That's the purpose of my existence on the planet. My late husband, while he was dying, said, see what you can do with what we've learned. So I say namaste to everybody listening, and I hope to be of service to anybody who seeks me out in a way that they need service that I can serve them. So this is a wonderful opportunity, Tara. Thank you so much for the good work you do, the organization of this conference, and your very insightful knowing that the world needs this now. And I hope as many humans pay attention and take a peek at what you've put together. I'm really impressed and I'm honored to be part of this. Thank you so much. And we will make sure we have a link to your work under this interview so people can get directly to your website. And we can also make a list, you know, of people who are interested in making a call with you too. So we'll... Absolutely. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much, Lynn. It's just been... I wonderful. were hugs to you across the miles. And to you too. And to everybody who's been watching, lots of hugs to you too. Look. Thank you.